Hello everyone, Blind Metal Gamer here once again, and it is now time for another episode of the Blindside Podcast. This is a bonus episode as part of the current season, and in this episode, Kentucky Blue Blood is back in the studio once again to share more of her story and lived experiences of what it was like growing up with a disability. And before we get started with today's presentation, I do want to say real quickly Trigger warning, this subject matter may trigger emotional responses, feelings, and thoughts within you, the listener. So, if these type of things are triggers for you, this is your chance to click away from the broadcast right now and go do what you need to do. So, for those of you who are staying to listen or who are going to listen either live or when it goes on demand... Here we go, and at this current time, I present the amazing and vivacious Kentucky Blue Blood with more of her story and lived experiences. Kentucky Blue Blood, the floor is yours. Thank you, Blind Metal Gamer. Uh, You have been a good friend to me in the disability community. Thank you for giving me this space to share my story and lived experience uh, with the state of Kentucky and the systemic abuse that goes on in our state every day with families like mine and people with disabilities. If you don't know your rights and know the pitfalls you can get put in an institution or anything can happen to you, they can use your disability against you. So um, I'm going to start, I'm just going to do a little quick preview of what led up to me even ending up here, you know, cause I'm looking back, I'm, I'm at retirement age now. So I'm looking back at when I grew up in the sixties with uh, a sister and two brothers with a rare genetic disorder and they had disabilities. They couldn't walk, they couldn't talk. Um, and there was nothing in the community. Basically, their whole life was going to children's hospital, and then eventually they had to be institutionalized. And what I didn't realize until I had my own case with the state was my parents must have had a, 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 a case similar to mine, a dependency case. And, uh, you know, Tim and I had talked about doing the parents' perspective uh, because everything's about the kids. But at the end of the day, you need to look at how parents are being affected by these removals, especially when it's children with disabilities, because uh, any remove, removal uh, is uh, disrupts the family system. And that, that affects generational. There's a generational pattern that occurs, and that's kind of what I'm seeing now looking back. The same thing that happened to me at 15 happened to my my me and my daughter when she was 15. So anyway, um, but my parents were devastated when those children were removed and taken to the institution. And then them dying in restraints. I mean, I don't know how they could bear it. And, and that's part of the reason I'm so adamant about restraints and people knowing their rights and, and people getting hurt. I mean, it's 50 years later. I, I'm still waiting on records on my sister's death. The state's using HIPAA to keep me from my sister's records when she, because you know why? You know why the state doesn't want you to have any records? Because why the, state, the state is guilty. The state has got their own incriminating evidence written. They, doc, they chart their own abuse that they're doing. Like when I finally got records on my sister and brother, at Hazelwood, they were in restraints 16 hours a day. That's what I mean. Now they don't want you to have the records because they are doing stuff that, you know, and, and, I mean, it just boggles my mind. So where was the state for us for other children? We were taking care of those children as children. So that, but now the state's going to come in when my daughter's having a baby. And we had everything all worked out. I mean, it was just, she was almost 17 when they came in, but um, they used my mental illness, my so-called mental illness, come to find out I'm not mentally ill. It was trauma. It was unresolved trauma from my childhood and all the things that happened to me. We're not mentally ill. It's what happened to you. It's, It's not 
what's wrong with you. It's what happened to you that's making you act the way you are. So anyway, um, I got out of the I got out of the house. I was a lot like my daughter. I mean, I was rebelling at age 15. A lot of the same things happened to us, and she doesn't even realize that. But um, I went ahead and I got out. I got out of high school early. I graduated early. I started college at 16, and uh, I went to work for the railroad at 18. That was when they started having to hire women. I broke through a lot of glass ceilings and a lot of people don't realize they're on the backs of people like me and my mom. But anyway, and I want to talk a little bit about that because, um, you know, she's acting like she's the first person in our family that got a degree. Well, you know what? In 75, 76, women weren't even hardly going to college. That's when it kind of started where women started getting encouraged to go to college. But right. I, was, I was the first person to go to college in my family. So, um, and my mom ended up, you know, getting a nursing degree and her sister also got a nursing degree. Uh, my dad was a veteran. That stuff counts. That's important stuff. That's not people that are degenerates, you know, that are sucking off society. We never got any kind of help. We didn't get social security. We didn't get food stamps. There was no food stamps back then. My dad right. had to keep the same job to keep Blue Cross on those babies. And uh, we were poor because of them and the expenses from them. And and so anyway, um, I, I came out okay in spite of the, you know, rough start I had. And um, I, I met Tiffany's dad and we got married. He was from Indian Hill, Cincinnati. He did not have a degree, but again, his dad was an army ranger and he, he didn't serve in the military, but they were auto rebuilders and they could take any kind of historic exotic car, Rolls Royce, any kind of car, mainly Corvettes they, they focused on and rebuild it from take a, take it all apart and rebuild it. They were called auto rebuilders. So what, that, what is, is, that is a gifted, talented thing. The average mechanic can't do that. So what you're saying is, is they could take a car and rebuild it from the ground up. Just to kind right, of give, right. give our listeners a good mental picture of what you're referring to when you say right, and they don't even have they don't even have people like that today. But oh, it's wow. beyond just being a body shop. They were auto rebuilders, and actually, Robert's grandmother was Queen City Air Conditioning and Furnish. She was one of the first women to have a business in Cincinnati. Oh, so wow. my daughter comes from good people because what she did, she wrote this book. Mm -hmm. And she's dissing the family. And she even picked on my poor mom. My mom worked her butt off and bought a little one-bedroom house. And it was so cute. It was like a little dollhouse. So but we struggled. We were all independent women with no men. The men were weak. Mm -hmm. The men died off or whatever. But we're strong as women. And you better be able to handle us because we're a lot. And she's just like me. That's part of the problem, too. But anyway, Robert and I got married um, in Indian Hill, and uh, he had just lost his father, and his mother was dying of cancer when I met him, so he was very close to his parents. He worked with his dad in the shop. He had disabilities. He had dyslexia, but he had some other disabilities, too, but he didn't tell me any of that, so that's why they kept him in the shop and stuff because he had to, you know, you had to work differently with people like that, especially back then because they were Catholic and he went to Catholic schools and stuff and the nuns were mean to people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. They were abusing people with disabilities in the Catholic schools too. So may anyway. I, um, may I ask a question briefly? <laughs> if you don't mind. You were talking about the Catholic schools. Um, I don't want to get off on that, Tim. Just let me keep to my story. <laughs> I'm just okay. giving you, I mean, I'm just saying the nuns would p bend his hand back and beat his hand with the ruler. Ouch. And it wasn't just kids with disabilities because I dated other Catholic guys and they told me the same thing. Ouch. All right. Continue. But there was abuse in the public school too. I mean, that's just relative, but we as parents weren't beating our kids. Robert and I never spanked Tiffany, you know, none of that happened. But what did happen, basically, Robert and I got divorced um, and went our separate ways. And he went out to California and I went out to Florida with Tiffany when she was three. 
and he didn't pay the child support. And I couldn't get the child support because I was in Florida. Ken Easterling, little Hitler, was blocking me in Kentucky from getting my child support. He said, you find him, we need an address to get your child support. Well, back then, you know, there was hardly, there was computers, but it wasn't like today where you could find people and locate people. Like you'd have to hire a private investigator or something. Right. So um, I decided to sell my company and come back because we didn't have any family in Florida. And Tiffany was close to my older or my younger sister and her husband because she, you know, they watched her some when I had business stuff to attend to. Mm -hmm. So she was close to them. And uh, my mom was here. My mom was getting worse. She had had some heart problems. So I put the company up for sale and it sold in 30 days. I didn't think my company would sell, but they took, they, you know, they took the asking price and we had a nice life in Florida. We were members of the university club. You know, we played golf. We were out on the ocean all the time. She went to Disney world. We went to Key West. I mean, we did everything in Florida. We had a great life. My company did well. So anyway, I sold the company and we came back here. Well, I kind of got blackballed here. Um, I, I went to work for another glass company. And eventually he was paying uh, the guy that my friend $100 more a, a week than me. And I'm a single mom raising a kid. I mean, he was he was a single dad raising two kids. His wife had just died, but... The point is we should have been making the same amount of money. I actually had more accounts than he did. So, um, you know, I went to the owner of the company and I'm like, Hey, this is the situation. He's like, well, that's how it is. And I'm like, well, I'm going to have to open my own company then. He goes, well, go ahead. I said, okay. So I did it. I'd gotten the payoff on my, uh, where I'd sold the company in Florida. I got that lump sum. So I opened a company from scratch, another glass company, replacement glass company. Mm -hmm. And I ended up in a bunch of lawsuits. No, nothing against me, but I ended up going after a doctor that had sexually abused his patients in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And I went after Bobby's trust fund to get my child support. Mm -hmm. And I just ended up in a bunch of litigation. And I pissed off Ken Easterling, the prosecutor. And I didn't know how none of this worked because that's what I'm saying. In retrospect, somebody needs to investigate little Hitler uh, because I pissed him off and didn't even know it. Uh-oh. Right. I didn't even know who he was, but believe this, <laughs> he knows who I am. And to this day, I could go get arrested right now. And that son of a bitch would have my case right in his court because that's what he does. He looks at those dockets and pulls them out. But anyway... Um, I ended up in a lot of litigation. Well, one of the things I was litigating was um, the guy I was renting from, David Jose, owed me over $30,000 in receivables. And he had, mm -hmm. he had me croaked right there. Mm -hmm. And the doctor was connected to the mafia. So I opened a big old can of worms I didn't even know. I thought, you know, they would, that doctor, they were supposed to file criminal charges. And they blocked me from filing criminal charges. I tried up until that doctor just died a couple of years ago. And I tried up until he died. Kenton County has that case. They were supposed to charge him criminally. I was not the only victim in that case. So anyway, I pissed off a lot of people. I stirred up a lot of shit. And he was treating judges and lawyers that are in Kenton and Campbell County, Boone, this area. Mm -hmm. So you don't know where the puppet master is, but um, Rob Sanders' father was his attorney, Bob mm -hmm. Sanders. Mm -hmm. So all of that has disappeared from Lexus and the system. Uh, but I do have documents to prove that case. I had, It was in the newspaper. So that hit the newspaper. I had the feds get come in and that made little Hitler mad. The feds took over the case because it was over $5,000. It was federal. Mm -hmm. And he was the first felony child support case ever tried. And the only one in the Eastern district. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I was dealing with the feds to bring him back. He was in California. They found him in California. Uh, mm -hmm. But I was wrong for all that. And this is where nobody gets it. 
what I found out when I got into the trust and started fighting the trust. And I wanted to add Tiffany to the trust because his mother died right as she was being born. So she wasn't part of the, you know, the other, like with the other grandchildren. Right. So, um, so in that case, I, when I got into the records, I went through all the records in that, uh, in the trust file. I found where Robert's sister had forged his name on a power of attorney to get his income from the trust that was supposed to go to me for child support. So his sister had been getting my child support all those years instead of me. And she had faked a power of attorney to do it. Oh, wow. And nobody did shit to her. She got away with that. So the only thing I could do to help the man I realized, I mean, I felt horrible for him. Well, they brought him back. It took six weeks for the the, uh, the marshals to bring him back from California by car. And mm -hmm. um, he it was rough. I mean, and then he ended up getting raped in prison because they sent him to the wrong, they sent him to the Orient by mistake. So I try to make it right with Robert because Robert wasn't guilty of non-support. His sister was guilty of, stealing his our, our my money for child support period and his sister and i have fought believe you me his sister and i have fought and uh he and his sister fought too a lot not physically but uh because they're great she's great she was greedy she's dead now but like i said they came from money and she married up into the lunken family the lunkenheimer family my mm -hmm. my nieces are lunkens and uh but she was stealing all, all her parents' assets and Bobby's, and, and there was uh, there was just a lot of stuff stolen from him that ended up in the trust. And um, and Tiffany didn't know her dad because when we left, she was three, so she hadn't seen him like for eight years mm -hmm. or been in touch with him at all. And mm -hmm. uh, so she was mad at him. I was mad at him. Everybody was mad at everybody. And nobody was communicating. That was the whole problem. Um, so I made the feds aware of it. You know, the feds, I, I feel like the feds did wrong in this case. Uh, but the feds, here's how it goes. Let me get on with the story because I'm, I'm giving you too many details. But um, so when he comes back, the feds send me down to the jail because we're still looking for assets trying to get my money. So they wanted me to go talk to him and try to find out where, you know, where his assets were. Well, in the meantime, <laughs> we ended up getting back together and uh, decided to remarry. And uh, so when he got out of jail, we remarried. But I, what happened is they sent somebody into my company and they broke my arm and tried to steal tools. And then they filed charges and said I hit them and stuff. So I got scared and I closed the company just like a month before he got out of jail. And he could have ran that company with me. He could have put the glass in and stuff. He was, like I said, they rebuilt autos. There wasn't anything he couldn't do. Mm -hmm. um, he could do construction and all that. But, um, but I panicked because they were coming after me in retaliation for the doctor. And what I had done the last year, I had to, I had to not take any salary out of my company. And um, so I had no income that last year. And my daughter was used to a nice lifestyle. Uh, and so was I. But when you, when you become disabled and poor, there's no safety net. There was no housing. You know, there was nothing for us. We, I got on the list for housing. I never qualified for housing with her. I qualified, but there was a three-year waiting list. So, so anyway, she didn't like me marrying, remarrying her dad. She was mad about that. And she fought me on that and she fought him and she did not want him in the house. So that was a constant fight from there on out with her. And she had become oppositional even before I remarried him. And I'm sick. I'm devastated and I'm fighting everything. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So in the meantime, when I told on the doctor, they started giving me psychiatric drugs and medicate me real heavily so with the combination of all those lawsuits and all that going on at the same time i think i had a nervous breakdown you know but i was also physically sick getting surgeries and now i realize like there was toxicity but um so what happened um i'm waiting it's two years for disability 
We tried to keep her out of the way of coming to Covington and ended up getting pregnant like she did. We took her down to Oneida to put her down in boarding school down there, but they let her decide at the end of that tour. They let the kid decide. It's not up to the parents. Of course, she didn't want to stay down there, and she didn't. So then we did take her over to Marymont because he kept an Ohio residence mm -hmm. um, and put her in Marymont schools for a short time. And of course she, you know, she sabotaged anything I tried to do. And the other thing I asked, um, my sister and brother-in-law, the cop, um, mm -hmm. if they would take her for a short time, cause I knew it was going to be rough until we could get housing stabilized. And they said, yes, we will take her, but only on the condition that we keep her six years till she graduates or five years, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, I meant a few months, not five years, bitches. So I said no to that, you know, and she didn't even know about that. So mm -hmm. what happened, we ended up down in Covington and she, the kids she got mixed up with were the gangs. They were into gangs. I was trying to keep her out of a gang. The school I took her to at homes, there were big, little girls with baby carriages in seventh, eighth grade. When I enrolled her, that's an epidemic down there that's still going on. And that's another systemic issue. And then she acts like she wasn't the only one that got pregnant. About 10 of her friends got pregnant. Some of them were black. Some of them were mixed. And all of a sudden, she decides she wants to be black. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not, I mean, I said that to a therapist and she laughed out loud. And it's like, you know what? I am dead serious. And it, there's nothing funny about it. So she ended up getting pregnant by a mixed boy. And like I said, I mean, it, it was night and day to our family. We weren't, I mean, that was probably the first mixed child that was born into either one of our family, Robert's or my side. And we weren't prejudiced at all. But number one, we weren't ready for any goddamn kid coming out at a, you know, teen pregnancy. Oh, who, having hmm. interracial issues to deal with on top of everything else. And when Roger found out the cop and little Hitler, oh my God, people were mad at me over her getting pregnant. They all blamed me for that. Like, I, you know, I got the blame for everything. Not Robert, not Noodles, me. I had to pay for everything. <laughs> it's like Robert didn't have to pay. Noodles never had to pay. Now, who's Noodles? Oh, Noodles is uh, the baby's dad. Noodles is who she got pregnant by. Okay. And Noodles ended up becoming like my son. I love Noodles to death. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was mad about that because after she and Malik left, Noodles and I stayed friends. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> so finally, before she gets pregnant and everything, finally I get my disability money. It took two years. We had no money other than food stamps. No money, no cash, mm -hmm. food stamps and Medicaid until mm -hmm. I got disability. So we finally get disability. That's when she got pregnant, when I finally got the money and we got, you know what I'm saying? We could breathe. Mm -hmm. So uh, once she got pregnant, I mean, it was it was bad because she was a teenager. She was acting out. She was fighting in the schools, trying to get kicked out of school. Everything she was doing, I realize now, she was trying to get me in trouble. <laughs> I'm like, God, I mean, I'm like, gosh, thanks a lot, Tiffany. I wasn't trying to get my parents in trouble. Were you, Tim? <laughs> Uh, no, uh, but yeah, I'll like put, so I would take her to school and, uh, she would go out the homes is a city block long or two. So I'd put her in the back door. She got the in front of the building, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then she'd be truant and I'd be getting these notes on my door. Like your, your kid's truant. I'm taking her to school and she's truant. You know, that's what I mean. She was, and she was so smart. She, she tested out of kindergarten with 130 IQ. So she oh, was wow. in a gifted and talented program down there. But when we came back here, they kept her. They didn't put her in the programs. It's clickish here. And that's a federal program. One, that's the same. See, I, I didn't know the advocacy around that then, but that's a disability to have. I mean, it's a gift, but it's also a disability if they're not giving you the schooling you need. And they didn't, you know, and, and so she wasn't challenged. And here she is so smart. And, uh, so they held her out at least one year. I think I got her back in, but I think they took her back out when she started middle school. 
So, and that, I mean, I understand what this did to her. I mean, I had no idea it affected her to the degree it did because, you know, I'm just trying to keep us alive and, Mm -hmm. you know, food, food, shelter and clothing was what I was concerned about. Mm -hmm. Um, So anyway, what happened, um, after 9-11, I, I was psychotic. I was The medicine I was on, I had psychosis. I think it had a lot to do with the medicine. But um, when I saw my psychiatrist, she didn't refill my medicine. And the kind of medicine I was on, you can't just stop that medicine, especially the, uh, the Ativan is a narcotic, and it can cause convulsions if you cold turkey somebody off of it, if you just stop it abruptly. So I didn't know what to do because there was like the only doctor, a psychiatrist would only write the meds back then. And uh, there was like a year waiting list for a psychiatrist. <laughs> so it's not funny, but it's just the irony of it. They tell you to take the meds. You're going to need this meds for the rest of your life. Then you can't get the meds. <laughs> mm-hmm. So anyway, I ended up, uh, I went to Mental Health America it was depression screening day. I'll never forget. And they said, well, go over to University Hospital psych, psychiatric thing, and they'll give you some medicine. And I did. I went over there. Oh, no. They did not give me my medicine. That would have just been so simple. Just give me my medicine. <laughs> no, they didn't do that. They put me in a clinical trial for Topamax. No informed consent. And I'm thinking I'm checking myself into the psych unit. No, no, no. They put me on a 72-hour hold. They cold turkeyed me off all my medicine. I had a bad reaction. I was in immediate withdrawal. I was in crisis right away. And they created it all. And then they put me on a 72-hour hold and wouldn't let me leave. So, um... That's why I'm against forced treatment right there, because that wasn't even, you know, the only way they're supposed to keep you on a hold like that is if you're a danger to self or others. Mm-hmm. And I was not. Um, so, and I've given you see feedback on that because that was very traumatic for Tiffany and me. But what they said to do while I was in there was to take her to children's hospital for a psych evaluation. Because she was acting out and acting out. And what they were doing, they were medicating me. I had her in treatment, but she wouldn't take the medicine. And back then, you know, they wanted everybody to take the medicine. So oh, yeah. that's why I'm against forced drugging. You know, that's why I testify against forced treatment. So I tried to take her for forced treatment. And that's what they removed her for, basically. Mm-hmm. And they, they told me to do it. CPS. And I was trying to get her before the court designated worker. Because she was out, of, she was beyond parental control. She was almost 17, but she was trying to move out. Here's her whole goal. She wanted to be emancipated. She didn't want me and Robert as her parents. She did not like us as her parents. I guess she felt we were beneath her. And uh, she wanted emancipated. Once And once she had that baby, the state complicates the situation because they're telling her she's medically emancipated. But I'm still in charge of her as my child and him as her child. So I'm trying to watch both of them, let her be the parent, but me stay back. And Mm -hmm. uh, so, no, we weren't going to let her move out. And we did talk to Joe Schulte, the attorney, that he took her to the day of the forced treatment thing ran, you know, failed. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't even consider getting it before the judge to ask for the emancipation. So, of course, she, that's what she wanted. That's what she was trying to do all along was move out on her own. Because that's what all those little girls that have those babies with the little baby carriages at Holmes High School, mm-hmm. they all get their own apartment. And not all of them, but a lot of them get their own apartment. See, that's their ticket out. And that's what she doesn't put in her book. She doesn't explain to you how she became successful. But she used Section 8 food stamps, Medicaid. She used everything the system has to help her get up out of that, including going to be in the first in her call in her uh, family to graduate from college. And basically what happened, um, Robert and I didn't get visits with Malik. We never saw him again after that happened. 
and they drug him through court for more support. They immediately took my part of her part of my social security. I got $600 for her, got nothing for Malik. So here I am trying to manage a household, her bringing in another mouth to feed, mm -hmm. no food stamps. We didn't, once Malik was born, we didn't, once I got my disability, we didn't get food stamps or, you know, she still got Medicaid, but, uh, it totally changes once you get your, you know, you get your money. And and so we didn't, she's trying to act like I was getting all this free stuff like welfare and I didn't get welfare. I don't have an issue. If you qualify for it, you can get it. I don't have an issue with it. And, uh, but I do have an issue. I don't like section eight in the projects. And I'll tell you why, because they treat you like crap. And, and you, they walk all over your rights. You do not have the same rights in public housing or Section 8 housing that you do as a normal tenant. And I do want to go back because we did, when I was, we had no housing, we had no housing. She had to stay with a friend. We had to split up. Robert stayed in Ohio and I, I, I was pretty much the homeless one. But, um, so I applied for the projects and, uh, took like 90 days to get in the projects. And then mm. when we got in there, the police ran through there and she, she put in her book that I had a pound of pot up there and that they somehow I got out of it. There was no pot up there in the project. Oh thing. man. If I had a, a pound of pot in the projects, I'd still be in jail from it. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. So, but Hey, I do smoke pot. I ain't going to lie. I do smoke pot. But I stopped smoking pot because that was the issue when CPS came in. Instead of dealing with all the problems, like telling her to mind her damn business till she turned 18, she mm. was already in college. She, I helped her get her GED and graduate because I had homeschooled her. And she was taking mm. college courses, working part time. She only had about 18 more months to wait, you know, until she turned 18. She had her permit. Mm. Um, we weren't doing anything wrong other than, yeah, mom, I did smoke pot sometime. I didn't smoke it around them. But uh, when I went into the psych unit to get my meds, I told them about the pot and I we had agreed I wouldn't smoke pot. So I wasn't smoking pot at the time of the removal. And mm -hmm. I would have been willing to never smoke pot again to have her and my grandson back home. Mm -hmm. So, but I never got that opportunity. And the way that's supposed to work, this is why I'm such an advocate against CPS, because we need court reform in CPS. Uh, and, and it's not just Kenton County. It's across every state. It's, it's, in every, it's across Kentucky. I've talked to hundreds of families that have been devastated by how CPS has treated their family. First of all, you never get to see your file. You never get to see what they have against you. They're just accusing you. They're pitting one family member against the other. And uh, get the records. There were plenty of records. You know, I had an RN coming into her because she did have a baby young. And she, she had the baby two weeks before her 15th birthday. <sighs> two weeks. I mean, yeah, it's horrible. She was 14 and pregnant. But it happens. I mean... My grandma had my dad at 14. I'm not encouraging that, but it's like she's acting like the first kid that ever got pregnant at 14. I mean, in Kentucky, it's not uncommon. It shouldn't have happened, but it's not only my fault. What happened at homes? Why are they letting little kids get pregnant down there? You know, the, their solution, put a daycare in the school. That's what they did. No, you're creating a problem. Those kids are seeing that as their way out. Have a baby, get food stamps, get free housing, get some coffee. Oh, yeah. You know, and that's what she did. She don't tell you in her book, you know, she's supposed to be motivating other people and mentoring young people. Uh, well, you don't do that by putting down your mother through the whole book and pointing out everything you felt she ever did wrong. And then, oh, then she also tried to say she thinks Robert was married when I started dating him. No, Robert was divorced. Robert had a 12-year-old daughter when she was born. She has a, she had a 12-year-old sister when she was born. Robert was divorced, and no, he wasn't married. But you know what? I did get an offer the day I married him to not marry him for $100,000, and that was from a married man. So there is that little tidbit. And also, I want to uh, clarify, Nancy and Roger 
were married to other people, their best friends, actually. Mm. And they ended up having affairs with each other's friend. So oh, don't wow. talk to me about having no affairs with no married men. No, your dad wasn't married when I met him. And even if he was, that's none of your business. You got here. You know, mm-hmm. you're a kid. You got here. But I, at the end of the day, before I was Tiffany's mother, I was a kid myself. I was a, a daughter, a sister, an aunt, a granddaughter. I have a whole lot of roles. And I'm a human being outside of her mother, being her mother. And since she was born, she was trying to control me and tell me what to do. And you know what? Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I don't care who it is. So, um, and she's just like me. So therein lies the problem. Hmm. But I, I, I mean, that's pretty much what, so what I saw too was at 15, I got pregnant. Hmm. But you know what? I didn't blame my parents. I didn't even drop that at their door. I figured out a way to get my butt on a plane and go to New York and get an abortion at 15. So we kind of come out of the gate pretty strong at 15 because once you're making a decision about whether to have a child or have an abortion, nobody's going to tell you what to do after that. And once she made that choice to have the little boy, I couldn't tell her what to do. She was out of control before that, but you can't make a teenager do something. You see what I'm saying? Unless you're the court You just can't make them. My mom and dad couldn't make me go to church once I was at a certain age. I couldn't make her go to church. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, you know what I mean? You cannot, you can only do so much uh, once your child gets to a certain age. Right. And I think it's not, I think it's all of us, how we reach our independence. Most of us, you know, become independent before we're 18. You know, right. There's rites of passage anyway. Mm-hmm. so I, I couldn't handle her and I should have I was trying to keep her out of juvenile and I should have just let her ask out of juvenile because the thanks I get she finally contacted me I waited 20 years it's been over 20 years mm-hmm. and uh, I was sick I had a heart attack in 23 or 22 mm-hmm. it was 22 mm-hmm. she contacted me mm-hmm. and um I was sick. It was the worst time she could ever contact me because emotionally all that stuff's still between us. You know, that's what she doesn't understand. We need therapy to be able to sit down and, and have a relationship from here because I have a lot of hurt and hard feelings. And so does she, and she's taking no responsibility for her, what she did. She's acting like it's all my fault. And you know what? It all happened on my watch. It is my fault. It's absolutely my fault. Mm-hmm. But I'm not going to take another beating from her 22 years later in her little book because uh, I didn't deserve the first beat down. I sure as second ain't is, is, is not taking the second beat down, mm-hmm. nor am I allowing Roger or Noodles to take it or not Roger, <laughs> Robert. And in her <laughs> book, it incriminates Roger and my sister because they made her not see me. That was part of the agreement. You cannot do that to people. I could sue them. I could sue her. I don't want to sue my family. That's why I didn't fight them in court back then. That's why I didn't let the case go. I was too sick mentally, but I'm not going to fight my family in court. Are you kidding me? No. And then she didn't let anybody see the little boy. The Rices didn't get to see him, nor did I. The black family didn't see him, nor did I. Then she had another little baby was a black man. And uh, she didn't let, they saw him at first. But once you make her mad, then, then that's it. So that little girl doesn't get to know either side of the family either. So is that fair? Is that the best interest of the child, little Hitler? Look what you did. This is all on little Hitler because this is the decisions he was heavy handed in that case. Every case he's all heavy handed in walking all over my rights. So um, my goal is I'm working back on reform of family courts and bringing disability rights into it. Because if you have a disability, it's in our legislature. They don't have to work to reunify the family. They can do what they did to me. Because I kept thinking, I have some kind of right here. And and you do, but you don't. Once you have a disability, the legislators pretty much are saying, 
we're not worth reunifying our families. It's kind of like Carrie Buck, you know, eugenics, like three right. generations. Buck of versus Bill. Enough. And, and that's that's what this case is. That was this case was totally in retaliation. They used her and my grandson as a pawn, and they extorted money from us on top of it. And she also got a large settlement from the trust fund that I could have taken, and Robert and I agreed to give it to her, even though she was gone and out of the house, uh, over $10,000. That was my child support I never did get. <laughs> I mean, he paid most of the child support, but I was still, I could have taken that because uh, I was still connected to the trust for the child support. But he had paid, he did pay the child support back to me. Mm -hmm. uh, but my point is, she didn't walk away. She didn't get hurt financially. I had to move us into another house. They took the income. I mean, this is devastating. Here I am. I've got a, a house for her and the baby. I don't need that house. Robert and I don't need that house. So, yeah, of course we have to get a cheaper place to live, another place to live. We've lost $1,000 of our income a month. Mm -hmm. And he's he's in the beginning of Alzheimer's stages, he couldn't work. I mean, he could sell a car here and there or, you know, do something on the side. He did some work for his sister, but I couldn't work at all. So, but, you know, he kept us in a car. I mean, even though, and he, he would like get her, you know, he was, he loved her so much and, and I'm sad for her. I'm really sad for her because I had hoped she would use her book for systemic change. She could have blown open what happened in that case. And instead, she's playing the victim 22 years later, you know, and it's like, really? And then she went to school and got a degree in social work in Kentucky. <laughs> and that just makes me like, really? So anyway, um, but it kind of, that, if you look up Francis Farmer, I mean, I felt like Francis Farmer. I felt like Carrie Buck. I mean, you know what I'm saying? You come in and you take my kid. And to me, they're my kids because he was like my own kid. Uh, and then they had taken my siblings and then they're going to come and take my kids 20, 30 years later and expect me not to react badly. Yeah, I reacted real badly. I was hysterical. You wouldn't find anybody more upset than I was. I was beside myself. I mean, I was homicidal, suicidal at one time. They didn't care a bit about my mental health. You know what I mean? I mean, where does, that's what I'm saying. You know what I, what I mean? Like, are you looking at what's best for the family? Are you looking at what's best for the state? And then there's also the state and that child support. There's money attached to that. And that's, they're running a racket with that child support too. Because they'll let it get in arrears like that. You know, and, and then they're entrapping people. If he can't afford to pay the child support and he has no way to make money, you have to take that under consideration. You know, a lot of these mom and dads get entrapped into child support when they have no way to pay the child support. That's a debtor's prison. So anyway, I also proved uh, the DNA for noodles because, you know, they were trying to say oh yeah that's probably not even his baby because that's you know that's just how people are they're just like mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. so i i made i mean i i did i was her guardian still so i i got the dna done and i made his little child support account set up and then she used the child support against him she kept him from seeing his son and it was over the child support but it was also she was mad at him because he was still friends with me and robert and she didn't like that. And she gave him an ultimatum. And he said, I'm going to stay friends with your mom. And that made her mad. And oh. he, was, he was such a good boy, though. I love Noodles so much. And I, he was in and out of prison. He didn't really do anything bad. Like, he didn't get arrested for drugs or anything like that. But um, he just was kind of a kid of the streets. You know what I mean? He just was yeah. on the streets all the time. But he was talented. He had a lot of uh, artistic talent. But I believed in him, and I showed him love. And he would call me mom. He always called me from the jail. And I was good friends with his grandmother, Carolyn, and some of his family I stayed close with. 
And every month we'd send him money and Robert would get mad at me because I'd send him money. But, uh, you know, I loved him. I wanted him to do well. You know what I'm saying? That's my great oh, yeah. dad. And he, he never had a chance in life. He was a foster kid. And I did try to help some of those kids down there because those kids just, they just needed love. You know, they needed, they needed attention and they, exactly. needed, to go. they needed a safe home. Uh, and, we can do so much better, you know. They oh, just yeah. throw these kids away. They, he, you know, they throw kids away. They throw families away. My family's worth it. My family wasn't worth fighting for for them. But you know what? They created this monster I am today in advocacy. And I'm fierce. And I'm known for my advocacy all over the United States. Probably outside the United States, too. But I, you hurt my people with disabilities. Then you hurt me and you kick us when we're down. You kill us and we can't file charges. You abuse us. You violate all the rights and the rules. What do you think I'm going to do? Lay down and take that? Hell no. So, you know, and they didn't get me but once. They got me twice. And now my grandson's out there somewhere. You know, I'm so mad at her over that. I did get to finally meet my grandson. But here's the problem. He has a form of autism, and that's not the problem. The problem is he has psychosis with it, and he they, they indoctrinated him into the Baptist religion, and I was raised that way. I believe that way. She believes that way. She's more like over to T.D. T. Jakes now, but he is uh, he thinks God speaks to him with numbers. Like he'll mm -hmm. see a number on a license plate and he'll look it up and he carries this little Bible book with him and he'll look up the number and he just won't stop talking about God. It's nonstop, nonstop. And they put him in psych and stuff. And, uh, and she dares to write in her book that he got in trouble and it's his fault. No, it's her fault. He got in trouble because he needed a safety net. He can't do it by himself. You know what I'm saying? He's very smart. He's very gifted, very intelligent. But there's psychosis going on there. And I, I now that I've seen him and I've, I've been able to watch her and I know my own traits and Roberts and Noodles, I think we all had some kind of form of autism mm -hmm. because we're very driven people. We're very smart and talented. Socially, we're awkward. <laughs> I laugh because <laughs> a lot of times I'll say the wrong thing or put my foot in my mouth. But um, hey, I've been known to do that, too. <laughs> but I think they've missed a lot of these autis autism diagnoses. Um, and, and there's not a medicine for us. Leave us alone. The best thing you can do is not medicate us. Just let us be. Let us be. This is how we are. If you let us be, we'll be able to achieve a lot for your community and your state. If you mess with us, you're going to have problems. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so I worry about him because it's important when you have a a child with a disability to get involved in the disability community in your state and to be active so that when that child's 18, he has some friends and resources in place. As, oh, definitely. As, uh, uh, an alternative support system. He turned 18 and she cut him loose. I mean, he ended up getting arrested because he was trying to live out of his car with his cat. And it reminded me of that little boy that got killed with the violin, Elijah McCain. And he even looks somewhat like my grandson. Well, he ran from the police because his, and he could have been killed. And that just crushes me because that's what my black family worries about. And my, when they have mixed kids or black children being mm -hmm. killed by the police mm -hmm. and, uh, what caused his psychosis was when his dad was murdered and he, she didn't let him see him all those years. And then he, he saw him dead in the casket and he, that caused psychosis. So we know what caused it, but, um, so yeah, the, the police chasing my little grandson and I find out after the fact and there, he went to jail for seven days no, he said the reason he ran from the police was because he knew that was where he lived and his cat lived. And that's the only way he could get to work. And like he was doing DoorDash and stuff. And uh, he knew he was going to lose his home and everything. So he panicked and he ran from him. And the only thing that saved him was the lady cop was mixed, uh, not black, but uh, like Hispanic. 
Mm-hmm. And she got to him before the white cops, the men. Mm-hmm. She saved his life. They would have shot him and killed him. You can't run from the police, especially when you're mm-hmm. black. Nope. So, uh, you know, he's out there somewhere. I can't get to him. I hit him for a minute. He don't want any technology. He was living in the woods for a couple of days. Thank you, fucking Ken Easterling. That's what you fuckers did. Because he would have had a bond with me if they hadn't taken him away all those years. I watched him every day until he turned, well, until they left. For 18 months, he was he was there. I was there with him. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but they broke that bond. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, uh, and then, of course, you know, God only knows what she's told him. And then her kids both read her book. But basically, you know, some of this, I know it probably sounds like I'm whining, <laughs> but I'm like, I'm like, you know, I'm trying to enjoy my golden years, years here and be a grandma and uh, it just ain't happening. You know, I waited all these years and sometimes it's just not going to be a happily ever after story. Um but I hope other families can learn by me putting this out here uh, of what can happen down there, you know. And, and the thing is, with that, with Tiffany going to live somewhere else, CPS and the courts didn't need to be involved. That could have been a change of guardianship. All of that could have been changed without any of the trauma and drama of the court system. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Right. But by them doing all what they did, they all got a payday. CPS got paid. All these people got paydays because of that. Mm-hmm. It's a racket. They're running a racket down there. And then they extort money out of poor parents and not give them any visitation. I mean, I just can't get over it. That's against the law right there to not give a, a, a person visitation or to withhold visitation because you're not getting paid. But nobody, I mean, how do you enforce these laws? That's what I mean. We have to have reform in family court, child support court. And then mm-hmm. Little Easterling's also running mental health court now, juvenile mm-hmm. court. That guy, I, I wish somebody would investigate him because God only knows what he's doing to these kids. But that's chilling. That man's running mental health court after what he did to me as a mental patient. Oh, wow. Yeah, think about it. It's a eugenics program they're running down there is what it is. It's a kangaroo court. Mm. So recently, uh, someone, <laughs> someone saw, I don't even know how he found out about me, but he ran for family court judge and he got a hold of me because I'm kind of, I worked with families for many years trying, and I helped some of them get their kids back. But mm. um, they ended up taking his kids. And they come after the attorneys, but he exposed a lot of it during his run up for family court judge. And Mm -hmm. he's got quite a bit of documentation uh, where we could move forward with the feds doing feds coming in and investigating him or uh, at least the very least getting an audit done of Kenton County family courts. Mm -hmm. It probably wouldn't help my case because, like I said, my case was over 20 years ago, but um, just the fact, why does why would it have to be punitive when you're dealing with families like that? You know, like, did they treat my mom and dad like that? Is that what they did to them? And I know they didn't let them see them when they removed my brothers and sisters because we had to wait like nine months. Like, they try to break the bond. You know what I mean? It's like, it's mm-hmm. weird what they do. But I guess that's what they're taught in their textbooks by Wolfenberger. Oh, yeah, I got to remember him. <laughs> well, it's all textbook. And, you know, that's why I don't do well. Mm-hmm. Argue, I don't want to argue with somebody, but I'm not, I, I don't have a four-year or six-year degree, whatever. I'm not trained that way. You know, they want to do this white paper stuff and, you know, talk in analytical terms. Now, I'm going to tell you what happened. I don't want to tell you what the book says. I'm going to tell you what happened to me. I don't care what your book says. I am the textbook case. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. 
But that prevented me. Robert and I should have been able to have, you know, had a decent life once I got my disability and stuff. And, and it just, I, I should have eventually been able to have went back to work. And you want to know why people stay on that? Well, the court's beating them down so bad that they're disabling them further. When you start messing with people's family. So, um, you know, that's why I do what I do. And it makes me really, really mad what I found in the disability community, how people are treated still. You know, I thought my, my siblings were isolated incidences, but they're not. And, and maybe that's why, you know, I, I do, I know I make people mad sometimes with my approach. <laughs> it's more direct. Well, it is. I'm blunt and straight to the point. I ain't going to pussyfoot around. Exactly. Say it fast and it won't sound like a whole lot. Mm -hmm. But I mean, and, and how do you bring that to the table? You know, I've had to give my story to the state in pieces, little pieces, little pieces, little pieces. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you kind of helped me. I mean, it's spotty, but you know, you, you've helped me at least get it all out there. Uh, I did try to write a book, start writing a book and I had an editor and mm -hmm. she she changed my words and she did not want to put nothing in there about race when you know when my grandson was born as a mixed child race has a lot to do with it nobody wants to talk about race you know uh, and and i no i'm not going to write my story if you're going to take me and then she didn't want my my siblings were in the first 36 cases of those diagnosed with Marinensko syndrome syndrome. Mm. And uh, she didn't want to say they were pioneers. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, they're in the first 36 out of 200 cases. I, so no, I didn't write my story because nobody's going to change my words. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, but I, uh, you know, I just, I wish everyone well, but I'm at the point of my life that I only want people in my life that bring me value or, you know, bring some kind of love and affection into my life. I don't want people that are haters or that, you know, are nasty to me. I, I, I cut people out of my life every year at the end of the year. It's like my new year resolution. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're toxic, go on down the road. I don't want you. Oh, you know, yeah. Oh, yeah. Me. I'm the same. So, Kentucky Blue Blood, may I uh, ask you something real quick before we uh, wrap up here and uh, things? My, my ask is, do you have anything you want to say to anyone that could be listening or watching uh, that you'd kind of mentioned is there anything you want to say to anyone you want to reach out to to kind of come to have them come back into your life would you want to say something to them and then attempt to reach out or no it's up to you well i think i pretty much said what i wanted to say i do hope one day tiffany might listen to this and malik but what i'd like to say to her is i never i look at a person's intent i didn't intend to harm you Ever, ever in my life did I intend to do any harm. And I have apologized to you profusely. And you said you've forgiven me. But I can tell you, don't forgive me because you don't want to talk to me and you don't want me in your life. But you also said to me, you didn't want me to be your mom anymore. You want me to be your friend or act like we just met. And I'll always be your mom and I'll always love you. I, you know, I can't be your friend. <laughs> but I'll always be your mom and I'll always love you and I forgive you. All right, man, powerful words from Kentucky blue blood on this episode. Um, so real quick, before we wrap up here, I do want to say that this has been another episode of the blind side podcast. Eventually this will be on Spotify as well. This is going up on YouTube first, so when it is up on demand, it will be available for on-demand listening or watching. So with that being said, if you like what you see and you want more great content, be sure to hit that subscribe button. And if you like what you hear or see, give this video a like, leave a comment down below, and share with everyone you know. 
for Kentucky Blue Blood. I've been your host, Blind Metal Gamer, saying so long, everyone, and peace out.